Isaiah chapter 49. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the joy we have in you. And to be able to say, yes, I will, is so easy to say when we have such a great God. And as we see again here in the book of Isaiah, the turmoil that the nation went through because they walked in disobedience, yet you always gave them hope. And we thank you so much for that. Even with all the judgment, we've entitled this book Hope because there's always hope. There's always a remnant. For those that cry out to you, there is always forgiveness and there's restoration. Maybe some need restoration tonight. Maybe they've been far from you. They just need to, again, re-engage with you tonight. I pray that you would meet them here. Meet them here, Lord. You have a, a desire to have a close relationship with all of us. And so we pray right now we draw closer to you through this time in your word. Bless it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. We all say amen. An elderly man wanted to go to just the park. And while he was there, there was a Little League baseball game going on. And uh, he went to the dugout of this little baseball game going on. He went to the little boy that was sitting there in the dugout. And he said, uh, hey, son, what's the score? He said, it's uh, 18 to nothing. The elderly man said, 18 to nothing? You're probably pretty discouraged. He said, no, we haven't got up to bat yet. <laughs> man, that's definitely hopeful, right? Down 18 nothing and having him. Wow, that's pretty bad. Sounds like the Astros sometimes. Uh, anyway, sorry, had to say that. Now, the reason why I talk about hope is because the first half of the book of Isaiah, it's really a lot of judgment after judgment, but God would always insert hope, and he does that again here as we look at these chapters, though God will remind them that they're going to be going into Babylonian captivity. There is hope. I will restore. I will bring back a remnant, and at any time we want to repent and come back to the Lord, he's always there, open arms. That's the relationship we have with such a great God. So let's jump into chapter 49. And we have the Messiah. Really, it's a prophecy here. It says, listen, O coastlands, to me. Notice it's a capital M here. So we believe it's really a prophecy of the Messiah speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. And, of course, there are so many prophecies concerning the coming Messiah, uh, even of his birth. We saw that in chapter 7 and verse 14, he would be born of a virgin. Um, but he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And, of course, when we see Jesus at the very end in his second coming, it says out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword to judge the nations. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me uh, from the womb to be his servant. Again, it's a capital S. Many believe this is speaking of the Messiah. To bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. And, of course, the mission of Jesus, as John the Baptist said, was to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord. Unfortunately, as we saw when our Messiah comes later and even in the future, as it is even in these verses with the people, the people rejected him. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Again, prophetic. Jesus came to be a light, interesting enough, to the Gentiles. And, of course, that blew away uh, all of the Jews at the time of Christ. It really blew away Nicodemus who came to Jesus one evening in John chapter 3. And, and he was questioning. He was part of the Sanhedrin. He's asking Jesus of these things. And Jesus goes on to say to him, he's speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. This befuddled him. What do you mean? You know, God came for everyone. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, me, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This was the, the desire and the coming of the Messiah. Now, thus says the Lord, verse 7, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhors, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. So the Messiah will come. Of course, some will reject him, but kings and princes will also worship him. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. 
And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. And certainly, you know, Isaiah is speaking, of course, to the people who will one day come back from captivity and come back to the land. It'll be blessed. But again, prophetically about the Messiah, notice he says he will restore the whole earth at the end of this verse. And certainly there's coming a time where when Jesus makes all things new in his second coming, he will, redu- he will do that. That you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed among the roads and their pasture shall be on all the desolate heights. So God would bring the people back. He'll do that at the end of the age. And of course, he would do that even at the time of, of uh, later on, it would be uh, during the time of Jeremiah, bringing the captives back from Babylon. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north, the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people, and he will have mercy on his afflicted. And, and certainly, most believe this is, again, speaking of the time when God would bring back the children of Israel back into the land to comfort them. Yet, while they were in captivity, they had lost heart. And they would lose heart. Look at verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. And my Lord has forgotten me. And we know that during seven years of captivity, the, the Jews definitely got discouraged. They, they thought that God had abandoned them. And maybe you've had those thoughts even before in your own walk with the Lord. Maybe you're going through a difficulty and you're wondering why God doesn't answer right away. And you kind of feel isolated. You feel like, well, God, it seems like he has abandoned me. He hasn't answered my prayer right away. He's forgotten about me. We can have those same feelings ourselves, right? That happens. But look at God's word to his people. And this is a good word for us, verse 15. But God responds, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. The truth is, is hardly a mom who forgets about her child or a loving parent that, you know, forgets about their children. I mean, we love our children. We sacrifice for our children. We never stop caring for our children. And that's what the Lord is saying here. God had brought forth his people. He made them a nation. He had to take them into captivity, but he would bring them back. He didn't forget them. And God hasn't forgotten about you. You might feel in that place of isolation. Why isn't God answering now? But God knows what he's doing. He's at that perfect time. He will come. He will deliver. He's faithful. In fact, look at verse 16. He says, see, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Now, that's quite an interesting statement, right? Think about this. If you were written on the palms of the Lord's hands, that means every time he looks at his hands, he sees you. And as we come to the Lord's table tonight and we are really celebrating and thanking God for a sacrifice on the cross for us. We think of the fact that his very hands were pierced at the cross for us. And every time he looks down at those, or we see those scars, and one day we will see those scars, we could be reminded of the fact that we've been inscribed on his hands. That's how much he loves us. Now, moving on, he speaks to Judah. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid waste shall go away from you. In other words, God would eventually deal with their captors. Lift up your eyes, look around and see. All these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. For your waste and desolate places and the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. In other words, when you come back into the land and and God begins to bless you again and you multiply, it's just going to be, you're going to be packed out. God is going to abundantly bless you. Then you will say in your heart, Who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children? I'm desolate, a captive, wandering to and fro. And who has brought these up? There I was, left alone. But these, where were they? In other words, how can this be? We were captives. And yet now you've abundantly blessed us. God says, 
Thus says the Lord, behold, I will lift up my hand in an oath to the nations and set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. So I will bring you back. You will be carried back. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to earth and lick up the dust from your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. So he's saying as you're in captivity, wait, trust in me, I'll bring you back. And instead of being a servant to other nations, those nations, kings, princes and queens will bow down before you. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you and I will save your children. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh and they will be drunk by their own blood as with sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. I will bring you back and I will be your God. Chapter 50. Thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce? Whom have I put away or of which of the creditors to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities have sold yourselves and your transgressions, your mother, has been put away. And so it was in their captivity, again, distraught that God didn't, you know, rescue them right away. They're they're saying, well, God, you don't care for us. you've, You've divorced us. And God is saying, if I divorced you, show me the certificate. Produce the document, you know. The truth is God had never divorced himself from them. God loved them. But as he says here, it was your sins, it's your transgressions that have brought you into your captivity. Why when I came was there no man? Why when I called was there no one to answer? So God was saying, where's those, where's the righteous men? Where are the godly men? They were nowhere to be found. Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem or I have no power to deliver? And of course the answer is no. Indeed, with my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there's no water and, uh, and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. What, what he's saying is I have plenty of power to make blessed or to even bring judgment. But what God is saying is I never gave up on you. And so moving on, Isaiah gives a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah again. The Lord has given me And most believe he's speaking of of Christ speaking here through the prophet. The tongue of one of the learned that I should know how to speak. A word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear the learned. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious nor did I turn away. In fact he says verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me. And my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. So again, uh, you'll find this, and we mentioned this when we began this book, you'll have the prophet speaking either to the generation then or speaking of the Messiah in the future or sometimes speaking in first person. And so here you have the Messiah describing what is to take place at the crucifixion. The Gospels give us the grueling details that Jesus' back was scourged by Roman soldiers. He was blindfolded and struck repeatedly in the face. He was spat upon. They pulled out his beard. This is the description we have right here. The scourging alone, by the way, historians tell us many would die just by that alone. And so you think of all the things that Jesus went through leading up to the cross. Amazing. And he did it all for us. Again, we come to the Lord's table tonight to thank him for that. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. And so though the cross was humiliating, excruciating, Jesus was no victim. The truth is he went there of his own volition, and he would be ultimately raised from the dead and glorified, sitting at the right hand of the Father, not ashamed. Why? He who is near me justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Now, Jesus certainly had the devil as his adversary to come against me. But here's the very thing. What Satan thought was bringing about his victory, bringing Jesus to the place of the cross, actually became his demise as Jesus rose from the dead in victory. And so the Lord says, surely the Lord will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? 
Indeed, they will grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. And so how important it is for us to heed those words. When we're worried, concerned about anything, we need just to trust in the Lord and to follow him. Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. In other words, if you reject Christ, you will be judged for that. So just kind of an interesting uh, end of this passage. It talks about Jesus in the first person, what he, he endures, what he goes through. And then even the judgment he gives to those who reject him. Now, chapter 51 And here we have God calling his people. So we're now back in the time of Isaiah. uh, But he's really speaking of the future, really, that takes place not far from now. As he calls the people to repent prior to going into Babylonian captivity. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Um. This is a good word. I mean, what he's saying is, listen, you're about to go into captivity. So don't forget how God blessed you. Don't forget how God redeemed you. He brought you up out of a pit, out of a hole. You were a nothing. You were a nobody. Same for us, right? David said in Psalm 40 and verse 2, God brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. He established my steps and he put a new song in my heart. And that is exactly what God has done for each one of us. We were blind, we were lost, we were in darkness, we were in a pit, and God in his grace raised us up. Thank the Lord. So this is what he's saying. Look at where you've come from. And verse 2, look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. All the blessing goes all the way back to Abraham. I called you to be my people. And the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all of her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving in the voice of melody. In other words, if you follow me, I'll bring you blessing. Listen to me, my people. And get ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me. And I'll make my justice rest as the light of the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me and on my arm they will trust. So lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. So obviously that's a reference to the end times, right? What we looked at in the book of Mark just a couple of weeks ago for several weeks. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 describes this very thing. Peter talking about the end times, he says, The day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, and the heavens and the earth will pass away with a great noise. The elements of the earth will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This is what the Lord is saying here. Verse 6, My salvation, though, will be forever. And my righteousness will not be abolished. So uh, I will bring an end to all things, but those who follow me will live with me forever. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them up like wool, but my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation." So I love God. He, he warns us here, do not fear the reproach of men. That's, that's a danger that we all can fall into, right? Because we feel pressured. We're outnumbered. Let's face it. There are probably 90% more unbelievers than Christians in the world. And yes, I think I'm being generous by saying 10%. It's probably less than that, to be honest with you. Truly born again believers. So we're outnumbered. The pressure's on. And people pressure us. And, and there's this, oh, what do I say? You know, and, and we can walk in the fear of man. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. And the Lord is saying, don't fear the reproach of men. Don't be afraid of their insults. My righteousness is forever. My salvation from generation to generation. Trust in me. Now, moving on, Isaiah addresses then their future release. He's warning them, saying, don't forget I'm out. You're going to go into captivity, but I will bring you out. So awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. 
Are you not the arm of the uh, cut Rahab apart and the wounded of the serpent? Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, and made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? The answer, of course, is yes. God is the one who delivered them in so many instances, whether it was parting the Red Sea and so forth. So, he, so the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. In other words, I'll deliver you. You'll come back into the land with everlasting joy on their heads and they shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. I am and I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? Um, perhaps even referring to the king of Babylon at the time. You know, why would you be fearful of Nebuchadnezzar? He, he's just an ordinary man. I'll, I'll bring you back. And the son of a man will be made like grass. And you forget the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, who have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor when he is prepared to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, that he should not die in the pit and that his bread should not fail. In other words, don't fear the oppressor. I will bring you back. But I am the Lord your God who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I might plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. Awake, awake. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury, and you have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. Now, that's an expression, you know, drinking the cup. Even remember, Jesus said, if this cup might pass from me. And, and of course, that was the full wrath of God. And what he's saying here is you guys have taken a lot of judgment. You've drank it down because of your sin. And but I will bring you back. There is no one to guide her among the nations she has brought forth, nor is there any who takes her by the hand among the sons she has brought up. These two things have come to you. Who will be sorry for you? Desolation and destruction, famine and sword, by whom I will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets like an antelope in a net. They are full of fury of the Lord, the rebuke of God. So God is reminding them why they went into captivity. Notice he says you're like an antelope in a net. You know, that's what happens when you're in sin. You just kind of go wayward, go off track, and you're, you're entangled in your own sin. And this is what had happened to God's people. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it. In other words, when the time is up, it would be 70 years, by the way, of Babylonian captivity. I will bring you back. I will put you in the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. And I have laid your uh, body like the ground and as the street for those who walk over. And so God is essentially saying that to the Babylonians, I'll ultimately judge them for dealing harshly with you. Now again, chapter 52 kind of begins like the last verse and several times in it. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. I will stop the pagans. I will stop the Gentiles, the Babylonians. No longer will they torment you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing. And so they, for nothing, for free, they went after false gods, right? Played the harlot. But God says, you shall be redeemed without money. And I will freely bring you back, is what God is saying. What a, that's grace. For thus says the Lord, my people went down at first into Egypt and dwell there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing? So first Egypt, then the Assyrians, then, of course, finally it was the Babylonians. Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord. And my name is blasphemed continually every day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. So God wants them to know, I will redeem you. I will bring you back. And again, this is coming through the prophet um, Isaiah to the people. 
And then we have this great passage. I love this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, in context, he was talking about blessed are those people that are going to be running throughout the countryside saying God's people are coming back. The captives are returning. There was a small remnant there left in the city. And now all the people are coming back. And that's good news. Great news. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring that that glad tiding. However, this verse also has prophetic implications into the church age during the time of the gospel. Paul writes this in Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he says this, but how can people call on them if they haven't believed? And how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear if no one tells them? And how can anybody preach unless someone is sent? And then he quotes this verse, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings and good news. And so what Paul is saying is, you know, whoever hears the gospel, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. But people got to tell them. People got to tell them. And and he quotes this verse saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who use their feet to go out and tell people that Jesus loves them. I'll tell you what. Listen, God wants us all to have beautiful feet. Now, your physical feet may not look that good. (laughs) I I can speak. that's That's why I wear shoes. But you know what? God thinks we have beautiful feet when we use them to share the love of Jesus with the lost. And and that's what that is talking about in the New Testament. Would to God we'd have a burning heart for the lost. Uh, Last night, our our leadership, we have a regular meeting. We were meeting last night. And we, I just want you to know, as as the leaders of the church, the pastors, the deacons, and we were praying for our church. We were interceding for you and for ourselves that we might be um, a church that hears the cry of newborn babes coming into the, into the kingdom of God. That's, that's our heart's cry. You know, much of the church today in America is transfer growth. You know, you hear of a new church. Hey, there's a new church over here, over, over there, and they're just filling it up. I just want you to know most of that filling up, it's growing right away. That's just other Christians leaving other churches and going there. I know that as a fact because the reality is the number of people getting saved in America has been declining the last decade. It's going like this. That's just the truth. So when you hear a church growing, it's usually transfer growth. Now, that's wonderful. Some of you, many of you have come from other churches. You were over there. Maybe you transferred over here, moved here, or whatever. That's, that's awesome. But you know what? We want to see people born again, right? That should be our heart's cry. I love the fact that this last weekend we have our evangelism team. They were out in our parking lot uh, trying to bring in people. Come on here. We'll pray for you. We'll talk to Jesus about you. And, and then next month they'll be going out and going to different locations. And we want to do that. And we want to do that wherever we're at. So let's pray for ourselves. I'm praying for you. I hope you're praying for me. And let's pray for one another and for our church. We'd be a soul winning church. All right, verse 8, your watchmen shall lift up their voices with their voices. They shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. So this idea that they'd be up there on the watchman on the wall seeing the captives returning. What a great picture. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bear his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. So this is the picture of them now leaving Babylon. And when they left, they were allowed to take all of the treasures and the vessels used in the temple back to Jerusalem. And that's what this is referring to. Beautiful picture. Moving on, God says in verse 12, for you shall not go out with haste nor by flight for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So when you leave, you don't have to hurry up. Let's get out of here. They might change their mind. No, what we saw in chapter 45 of Isaiah was that God calls out ahead of time before they even go into captivity that Cyrus, king of Persia, After 70 years, he calls him by name, 150 years prior, he will release you. In fact, he will finance the whole thing. You don't have to go out in haste. I'll take care of you as you come back home. Now, moving on, Isaiah prophesies again concerning the Messiah. 
Behold, my servant, again, capital S, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And so, listen to this. We've got, we've really got a dual prophecy here. So the first one is talking about the Lord being extolled. And that's really a picture of his second coming. But then we have a picture of his first coming. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had been told them, they shall not see. For what had not, they had not heard, they shall consider. But notice here, you have a picture of Jesus prior to going to the cross. Beaten, Jesus was beaten so severely, he was unrecognizable. Uh, many of you have probably seen the movie, The Passion, and that gives you just a little bit of, of an idea of what it would have been like. But here's the reality. When they were beating Jesus, they put a, uh, a bag over his head and they began to punch him and say, who prophesied? Prophesied who punched you, Jesus? Tell us who that was. Well, understand this. When, when you are able to see someone, you know, hitting you, your body automatically winces and is able to stiffen up some of the muscles in your face to take the blow as hard as it is. But when you do not see where the blow is coming from, it makes even a greater impact upon your body. And the truth is, and maybe you've seen this, I, I've seen people that have been beaten so bad that their head swells twice the size of their head. That's what Jesus would have looked like. It, he was brutally tortured before his persecution. And, and we're told here it was marred more than any man, pummeled and, and tragic. So here we have this picture of what Jesus went through for us. Now we come to chapter 53 and we read this. And this is all of the Messiah. Who has believed a report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Jesus would grow up as a godly young man in Nazareth, tender in the eyes of those who knew him. And as a root out of dry ground, that's a term of disdain. He would grow up in the area of Galilee, despised by the religious elite. And he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That is to say that Jesus wasn't physically attractive. Now, that's not to say that he wasn't or that he was ugly or something like that. But what it is saying is that he was not a supermodel. Jesus was born an ordinary man, and he didn't have the advantage of good looks. That's what it's saying. Nothing special that we go, oh, wow, you know. In fact, verse 3 tells us that he was despised and rejected by men, and he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We can only imagine when he's arrested in the garden, everyone leaves him. He's betrayed by one, denied by another. He knew all about sorrow and grief. That doesn't mean that Jesus didn't laugh. I'm sure he had a hearty laugh. It doesn't mean that he didn't experience joy. He did. But because of the depth of his calling, most of all, the fact that he was God in flesh, having taken on humanity, his own creation, yet rejected by his own creation, we cannot fathom the depth of that disappointment and that rejection. And so he was despised. He was shamed. And our response as humanity, verse 3, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we didn't esteem him. So he's mistreated and we just turn our back, essentially. That's what mankind does. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Oh, he deserves that. But Jesus took our griefs, our sorrows. Wounded, verse 5, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the discipline that should have been for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Because he took our chastisement, our punishment, ultimately the crucifixion, we can experience eternal healing through faith in his name. And yet, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Yet with all that Jesus has done, we're, we're like sheep that turn their back on the shepherd and we do our own thing. But in his grace, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
The Bible tells us we all sin, we all come short of the glory of God, and God took all of that sin that we all do and placed it on him. And then we have a description of him at his trial. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, but he opened not his mouth. And, and this was something that was amazing even to Pilate. Pilate, governor, listen, he's prosecuted a lot of men in his time. He's put a lot of men to death. And in and, and Mark's account, chapter 15 and verse 3, uh, Jesus is there and Pilate says, you've been accused of many things, but why don't you answer? See how many things are testified against you. And Jesus still said nothing, it says, so that Pilate marveled. Why would he marvel? I'll tell you why. Because Pilate had heard plenty of guilty men defend themselves and deny the charges. But he'd never seen a man so blatantly innocent say nothing. Why did Jesus do that? Because it's for this reason he came to die on the cross. And so he will say nothing. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare this generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people he was stricken. So Jesus cut off, died from the land of the living. And of course, mind-blowing to the Jew if you take him to this passage. And this is a great place to bring a Jew. Because here we have the Messiah clearly and he would die. They don't know how to deal with that. Well, because the first time Jesus came, he came as a suffering savior. When he comes again, he'll come as a reigning king. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had no done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And we see this as well fulfilled in the gospel accounts. Jesus crucified with the wicked, a thief on either side of him. And the intention would have been when he was, you know, dead, would to be thrown him in a common grave. But later that afternoon, before, you know, the evening comes, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, asked for the body of Jesus, and he's buried in a rich man's tomb. And I was always like to say, it was no big deal. It never been used before, but that's okay. It would only be borrowed for the weekend, right? <laughs> and then we read this very strange statement, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he was put to grief. That's contradictory. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God to do that. But God had to do that. It was the only way to redeem mankind. He says in verse 10, when you make his soul an offering for sin... And so he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He will be raised from the dead. God will bless him eternally, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Pretty awesome passage. And again, just thinking of that as we come to the Lord's table tonight. Now, one more chapter we'll look at. And in this chapter, God brings his people back into the land, and he likens it to a wife that has been restored. And you'll see that as we move through here. Sing, O barren. You who have not born, break forth into singing and cry out loud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And so uh, Israel had been disgraced going into captivity, kind of like a barren woman is what he's saying. But God was bringing them back in the land. And so enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your courts. Strengthen your stakes. You shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. In other words, you're going to come back and you're going to expand. You're going to grow, as it's, we saw earlier. There's, it's too small. We need more room. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will not forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. In other words, I will erase all those former things and do a new work. And isn't that what the Lord does in our salvation, right? We, we have such an ugly past. I was meeting with somebody before we had our evening here, and he was sharing me his testimony. What an incredible testimony. And we both were sharing our past testimonies. Uh, they were kind of similar. His was more radical than mine. And we were just, isn't it so good to take all those things in the past, and it's gone. 
don't remember it anymore. I only remember to thank Jesus for the pit I was brought out of. That's it, right? God is good. Now, moving on, he says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He's called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says the Lord. For a mere moment I've forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. So again, it's like this beautiful woman being restored. But notice again, he says here right here, for a mere moment, verse 7. Verse 8, with a little wrath I hid my face for you a moment. Well, it doesn't seem like a little moment, a little wrath. Seventy years of captivity. But notice with everlasting kindness... I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Hey, listen, 70 years is nothing compared to eternity, right? For this is the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I will no longer be angry with you and nor rebuke you. Just as God promised I'll never flood the earth again with water, so he says, I'm not going to be angry with you any longer. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Well, that's a good word, right? Sometimes we think, well, God can't forgive me. I did this. He'll never forget. And that's not true. When God forgives you, he casts your sins as far as the east is from the west. He throws them into the depth of the ocean, never to be brought back up. I love that. And so moving on, God is promising them future prosperity. O oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempests and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. This, it'll be a time where God abundantly blesses them. In righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. In other words, if someone thinks, well, I'm going to come after God's people, I'll take care of them. We even see this later on in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38. And this is something to be fulfilled in the future. We know that the nations to the north are going to gather and they're going to come against Israel because they are prosperous even unto this day. For sure, God's blessing is with them. But God says, I will defend them. I will turn their, their, their own weapons against themselves. Read Ezekiel 38 or wait till we get there in a little while. Behold, I've created the blacksmith who blows the coals in fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy so God is the one who creates instruments, those for punishment and those to bring back God's people. But he reminds them, listen, and this is a good way to end, but he's reminding, listen, no weapon formed against you will prosper. No more. I will be with you. And every tongue which raises against you in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage, and I love this. You might want to underline, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. That's us. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says God. And that's true. My righteousness, I don't stand in any of my righteousness. My righteousness is as filthy rags. But I'm made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, and my heritage as his servant, no weapon formed against me, will prosper. So that's a good way to end here tonight. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, again, we're about to go to the Lord's table, we don't fight for victory. The victory was won at the cross. We fight from victory, you see. And so, yes, we do do wrestling against principalities and powers, against forces of darkness. But we've already ultimately won the war through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 8.31 tells us we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Or as we read right here, listen, no weapon formed against us will prosper. Man, that's a good word, isn't it? So no matter what we're going through, the challenges, listen, that, that weapon can't ultimately come against me as a believer. And no matter what, listen, one day I'm going to die. One day I'm going to pass from this life. But I'm just changing address is all I'm doing. I'm changing address from here to glory. Amen. All because of what Jesus did. So let's pray.